Susan Ann Swaddell was a 19-year-old from Lake Elmo, Minnesota. She was introverted and very artistic. On January 19, 1988, Sue was on her way home from work when her car overheated. She pulled into a gas station. A few minutes later, Sue got picked up. She was never seen again. I'm Ed Denzel, and this is Unfound. Unfound has covered quite a few disappearances where there are signs that the missing person was set up. And most of the time, it deals with a concept called luring. Some examples. Tyler North. He was surely lured by his ex-wife to meet her at a park for sex. Tyler then was murdered by her and her boyfriend. Stephanie Hartwell was surely deceived into getting into a car with a frenemy who was most likely working on behalf of a guy who Stephanie was avoiding. And Jeff Nichols, his ex-wife knew he could not pass up a free set of golf clubs. Jeff went to get them and never returned. None of these victims could have ever suspected that they would become the centers of investigations that are still unsolved all these years later. But in looking at the diversity of just those three, you the listeners should know that this can happen to anyone. Well, with Sue Swaddell, we are certainly looking at a suspect who had a plan. But you cannot call it luring. It's one that has a lot more variables than those others. But somehow it worked. Who set this woman trap? And now a summary of the case. This is brought to you by my friend Megan Lainez's website, charlieproject.org. Sue Swaddell has to be one of the least complicated and more straight-laced missing people we've covered on this program. She had no addictions, no criminal record. Sue wasn't popular or unpopular. She was kind of right in the middle, having a close circle of a few friends. Sue was modest with her clothes and behavior. Probably the only quirky thing about Sue was that she dated a guy three years younger than she was for about 18 months, breaking up in late 1987. So, January 19th, 1988, was a day like any other for Sue. She went to her first job in the morning. Then there was a break, with Sue calling her sister during this time. Everything was fine. Then Sue went to her second job at Kmart. At closing time, Sue got in her car and left. There was a lot of snow so she would have been driving slower than usual. What we now know is that during the 15-minute drive home, Sue's car overheated. She pulled into a gas station, parked, then spoke to the attendant inside. But she did not ask to use the phone. Just a minute later, though, another car pulled in. A man got out, And Sue got into his vehicle willingly, leaving behind her purse and ID in her own car. She was never seen again. When Sue's car was later examined, police discovered someone had drained all the coolant from the engine by loosening a fitting on the radiator. People being tricked into disappearing is common enough. 
that it pays to closely examine cases where this appears to have occurred. But Seuss has some unique points that we have never encountered before. So please pay close attention to the interview while thinking about these three questions. Number one, what are we to make of information showing someone entered the Swedell home while it was empty after Sue went missing? Number two, why didn't Sue ask to use the phone at the gas station when she spoke to the employee? Would this not have been the logical thing to do? And number three, if someone really wanted to cause Sue's disappearance, why didn't that person just snatch her as she walked to her car at Kmart? Sue's family and friends have no doubt that the facts of that day show someone wanted to cause Sue's disappearance. The guest for this episode is Sue's sister, Christine Swadell. Unfound news. Well, it's official. I signed the contract with Spotify. I'm not sure when everything on the technical side will get done, I will keep uploading to Podomatic until I'm sure the downloading for all of you will go smoothly. But my guess is there will be a few hiccups. Or not. Next, please look for a new Unfound Now coming out next week. Of course, for you new YouTube channel members, you'll be getting the video this weekend. All of you should be also looking for the next newsletter. Finally, speaking of the new channel membership, the intro video is now featured at Unfound's YouTube account. Please consider joining. I'm telling you, for $2.99 a month, you're going to love it. Where you can find Unfound. Note, very shortly, you will not be able to find Unfound on the Podomatic app. Unfound is now a part of Spotify. However, you can also stream the episodes on iTunes, Apple Podcasts, YouTube, Stitcher, Podbean, and many other platforms, especially outside the United States. Unfound has social media accounts on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and YouTube. Speaking of YouTube, join me on Wednesdays at 9 p.m. Eastern on the Unfound podcast channel for the live show, the only one of its kind in true crime. Ask questions, chat with other viewers, and give the show a thumbs up. You can contribute to Unfound in the following ways. Number one, patreon.com forward slash unfound podcast. Number two, paypal.me forward slash unfound podcast. Number three, contribute during the live show with Super Chat. And number four, join the YouTube membership program for the low price of $2.99 a month. This week, I need to thank the following people for contributions to Unfound. Laura, Jennifer, Carol, There's Hope for Change, Charlie, Suzanne, Glenn, Jill, Debbie, Marcus, Twinkle, Carrie, Kathy, and Screaming. Phew. The website, theunfoundpodcast.com, the email address, unfoundpodcast at gmail.com, and please mention Unfound at all true crime websites and forums. Thank you. I'm so happy to have on this episode of Unfound the sister of Sue Swedell, Christine Swedell. Christine, welcome to Unfound. Good to be talking to you today. Uh, everyone should know, uh, the listeners should know that we are doing this interview on February 19th, 2022. Let's start here. Uh, you are Sue's sister, uh, older sister, younger sister. Do you have any other siblings? Let's just talk about that to start. Okay. Um, I'm the younger sister by three years of Sue, and I do have other siblings. Um, they're steps, um, siblings. Um, I do not have any connection with them. It was a lot of years apart, and there was a divorce in our family. Wow. Okay. 
So you would say that you and Sue grew up together, but these other uh, stepbrothers, step stepsisters were not in yeah. the same house. Well, they were in the same house. Mm -hmm. um, my dad and my stepmother, they lived in Lakeland, oh. and we lived in Lake Elmo. But I mean, um, after that, so, but Lakeland for 10 years. Oh, okay. Gotcha. Mm -hmm. All right, so you are, you are Sue's uh, younger sister. Um... So how did you two get along? How would you say you were in your relationship growing up, having a sister three years older? What was that like? Uh, how did you two get along? Do you consider yourself and Sue to be similar or very different? What would you say? We got along pretty well. I mean, sisters have their little squabbles and that kind of thing. But I think with a divorce, you, um, you bond. Um, you have a better, stronger connection. Mm. So... The house that we lived in was, um, stepmother was, you know, just did not want, um, stepdaughters. So, um, that's why Sue and I were just really extra close. Wow. So, yeah. Okay. If I can ask uh, what year or how old were you or how old was Sue when your parents got divorced? I was two. Oh. I was Wow, so, very, 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 very young. And we didn't go to um, the house in Lakeland for a couple years because there was the divorce and there were a couple years there mm. that, you know, we were living at our grandparents' house. Oh, okay. So um, in Lakeland, we would have been five and eight. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Okay. So when you moved up into uh, your teen years... Who was living, like, when she started, let's just say when Sue started going to high school, and maybe you were in junior high school or maybe elementary, um, you know, who, who was under this, who was all under the same roof then? Oh, we moved to um, our mother's house. Mom has moved from the Twin Cities out to Lake Elmo to make sure that she could get custody of us because... Um, mm. Living in the same, her attorney said living in the same county, living very nearby would help, and it did. Okay. So the custody switch was very, very fast. Oh, okay. So it, at that time, so it was ju uh, just you, uh, Sue, and your mother living together? Any other, other people? Oh, just Mom, Sue, and I. All right. Very good. Thank you. All right, so uh, she's your older sister, and you said, like, uh, like I guess a lot of siblings. You, you know, you're very close, but then once in a while, uh, there are some tussles here and there, totally understood. How would you, uh, moving on to Sue exclusively, you know, how would you explain uh, her personality? Was she extroverted, introverted? What would you say about her? Introverted. Introverted. She that way. It was very, just as a... Um, that's all I remember her as, is introverted. Um, mm -hmm. She really kept to herself. Um, she made sure that she only, she kind of just hung out with just a few um, people. So mm -hmm. she's um, probably their own little clique, I suppose. Yeah, sure. Um, yeah, she was just, she was going to church. She was going to, she wasn't a party girl or anything. She wasn't out um, mm -hmm. in high school, she was just, since we lived in Lake Elmo, she had two of her closest friends right there in Lake Elmo, so they really just hung out, um, okay. quite a bit, so there was, mm -hmm. you know, they, they were, they were both introverts as well, so, yeah. um, they kind of just kept in that little three, three okay. group, so, mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, did Sue uh, allow you, the little sister, to tag along sometimes, or or was it just mainly just her friends and you just had to find your own friends? No, oh, I gotta find my own friends. <laughs> okay. That's how it usually goes, doesn't it? Yeah, yeah, I suppose it does. Yes. Yeah. Okay. All right. I mean, that was as a kid as well. I mean, she had, you know, three years is a lot when you're yeah. a teenager. Sure. So. Good point. Um, she's in. High school and I'm in junior high. No, no, no. She doesn't want her little sister. She's trying to find her own friends. And even though it was just um, two of her best friends in Lake Elmo, I just, you know, even when I tried, she said, 
says, no, this is, this is my group of friends. Yeah. So it's a very typical situation. Sure, sure. So. Now, now, what's interesting to me is that um, uh, the listeners know that I'm 51 years old, so Sue and I, and of course, I guess myself and you, Christine, you know, we're all very close in age, so I have to ask, was Sue uh, kind of maybe into uh, the hair band music of the 1980s, like New Kids on the Block? What do you remember about some of her music tastes, maybe cultural tastes? What, do you, what was she into back then? New Kids on the Block would be later. So later. We were 80s girls. <laughs> okay. Um, you know, Robert Plant, she went oh. like that a little while. Yeah. There. So, yeah. Um, just picked her, you know, it wasn't anybody necessarily right in the end. She, mm. she liked musicals a lot. She, oh. She's kind of a, um, you know, of course she likes Cindy Lauper and Madonna and all of that. So mm. typical 80s girl. Yeah, you know, I like it. She, she wasn't wearing anything like, you know, crazy or anything, you uh-huh. know, like Madonna or something. Ha! Okay. You know, or Cindy Lop or anything. She was more into a more clean cut look. She's um, wearing mm. the, um, like a blouse type of thing with a brooch. So she mm-hmm. has more of like, I suppose, um, a Molly Ringwald look. Oh, yeah. Well, great. That's a... Man, that is a great uh, description there, Christine. Nicely yeah. done. I, I can see it uh, absolutely. Sure. Yeah. So sure. She wasn't. She would, you know, more lean on that. Okay. All right. So. All right. Thank you. Uh, how about her education? How did she do in school? What were some of her hobbies? Just to get to know her a little bit better. Yeah. Um, she did great in school. I mean, better than me. <laughs> <laughs> she was. Um, always getting the A's. So she was really good, and she got into River Falls, and she was really happy and proud of that. And mm-hmm. so she went to River Falls, and she was there for a little while, and she was homesick. But um, hobbies, um, mm-hmm. it was always just music. It was, you know, and she was an outdoor girl in the way of, um, you know, camping out and, you know, that a lot of that ended up being up at our cabin so you know Mm -hmm. but um and she really liked to ski she was an outdoor girl skiing skating you know for the winter and just um an outdoorsy girl so Mm -hmm. she liked to just kind of i don't know she's she's okay she's just a real outdoorsy girl yeah and And i and i don't think anybody would be surprised by that being that you lived in Minnesota. It's a beautiful state with all the, oh, you know, yeah. land of a thousand lakes and the snow yep. and all that. No, it's beautiful. Oh, yeah. She liked to do all the all the sports, but um, she, I'm losing my train of thought here. That's all right. Um, she liked to paint. She was very artsy as well. Mm-hmm. So she was drawing, painting, very much into art. So mm-hmm. Okay, very good. All right, so we have a good idea about uh, Sue and her musical tastes, a cultural taste from the 1980s. Did very well in school. Introverted, I can certainly, uh, you know, relate to that. And a, a very small group of friends, I can, I, my, I myself, maybe many of the listeners could also, maybe uh, relate to that as well. So let's move on. Uh, I, I have in the outline here just. I don't know. I, I titled them issues. I don't know if they are issues, but maybe some things we're going to get even a little more technical on some of this. But um, you know, of course, she was uh, you know in a, um, you know nineteen when she went missing. Uh, what about relationships? How about boys, uh, boyfriend uh, in high school, or did she not get into that until after high school? What can you say about maybe this uh, boyfriend slash ex boyfriend? Uh, that was in her life at one time. We're not using any names. Right. Um, she didn't, she did have um, really only just one boyfriend in high school. So, and he was an exchange student from Japan. Um, huh. They really, really liked each other. And of course, he had to go back. Yeah. Um, and she was pretty, pretty upset about that. And she did not. Basically, she didn't date. So, um, hmm. like I said, she's very, um, 
kind of very, what is the word I'm thinking about? Um, just to herself. She didn't, no. I think she just felt awkward in doing that. And she just, she, um, no. you know, it's not boys didn't ask her out. She just didn't want to. No. So um, she just wasn't in the dating world. So, you know, um, then when she went to college, she wasn't re- she wasn't dating that I know of. So when she got back home, then she um, we went up to our cabin and um, our grandmother said um, that there is a kid down the line there um, down the street. And um, of course, Sue and I were curious, so we went together. And um, that happens to be the same guy that um, was her boyfriend all the way up until um, Sue disappeared. Wow. So, um, okay. Pretty much. I mean, it was until December that okay. um, then they broke up. But he was three years younger, so he was my age. Huh. So there was a, a little bit of an issue there. Yeah. Who was with him. <laughs> How did, uh, being that you just brought that up, that he was your age and you're three years younger... What did you think about that? What did you think, uh, you know, um, your mother thought about that? Because I, I, I just have to say, I think that even today in 2022, a 19-year-old woman dating a 16-year-old guy is very unusual. How did you look at it back then? Well, I see it as she was, first of all, that's her choice, but it was mm-hmm. kind of, it was odd. Um, the family kind of wondered why she was going after somebody that was three years younger, but for me as a sister, I didn't find it unusual because she always kind of acted younger than her own age. I think it was just her childhood, you know? I mean, she, she seriously had um, a personality trait that was younger, mm-hmm. so she was not really, like, 19. She was more like probably around 16. She was more... Um, I sometimes, actually a lot of times, felt older than her. She was just yeah. young. Okay. Acting, so very naive. Um, okay. Yeah, she, she's just... Yeah. Gotcha. I, I totally understand. All right, so all right, so maybe that just went along with her personality at the time. It's, uh, and that's, uh, that's her choice. Uh, of course, me, you know, think about 19 to 16, I think maybe... At least uh, culturally, maybe if it was the opposite, that might, you know, even maybe in 2022, might people might be looking at that a little weird as well. But that's just the way yeah, it went. It was different. It was yeah. Different. Okay. But he, uh, was, he acted older and she mm-hmm. acted younger. So it kind of meshed together. Kind of worked together. And, yeah. Okay. Oh, gotcha. Um, just in general, just not even putting their ages into this. Um, how was the relationship and being now that we're all adults, do you, adults, do you have a different opinion on the relationship now than you did when you were 16? Did you think that they were a good match or, or what? Um, not when I look back, it's, mm-hmm. it seems, yeah, I mean, when you're in, within it at 16, I'm going to start out with that. When you're yeah. within it, it's like, well... It's her choice. Now, as um, as I get older and feel like I could be their mother, now, ah. it, it's kind of different. It's okay. different. But as a sister, again, I'm looking straight at her personality overall, and mm. that that would be something that I could understand, and even mom could understand because she's she's younger acting, so it it made sense. But I think to other people, it would be like, hmm, that doesn't make sense. So okay. she should be with somebody her own age. Yeah. Uh, but you have to know her personality. Right. Um, and what our childhood was like. And I think the childhood just, I think that's why she acted younger, because of that. So um, it all goes hand in hand. Okay, thank you. Uh, what you remember about the relationship, uh, how, how many times did you see them together? Would you say that they, and of course we know that they broke up and we're going to get into that in a moment, 
But would you say that they had a good relationship while they were together? It was like your typical teenage breakup, get back together, you know, a lot of drama. How would you describe it? Mm, typical. Typical, <laughs> Typical okay. teenagers. It's going to be moody. It's going to be I break mm. up and then I'm back together. Mm -hmm. It's very normal. Um, of course, you know, with her not having other, any other boyfriend but the exchange student, she would feel... You know, especially upset. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, if you had a boyfriend every six months, it wouldn't yeah. um, pursue not having, you know, just having the other boyfriend. It would be very, you know, for mm -hmm. her, being an emotional person, somewhat traumatizing um, for her. Um, she just mm -hmm. was extra sensitive, and she always thought she did something wrong when she mm -hmm. may have not done anything wrong. But yeah. it's just the moodiness of teenagers. Um, okay. You know, the up and down. Um, he was, for being together, it would be, I mean, he was an AP um, student, which meant, wow. you know. Wow, pretty smart. Very smart. Very smart. Um, and he went on to St. Thomas um, in business, but um, he was in our house a lot. Um, you know, I'd come home from school and say, does anybody, you know, they asked me where I was, it's like, school? You know? uh. um, it's like, does anybody know what that is? Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, it was just hanging out, you know, a lot yeah. of hanging out, and I guess what I'm asking, Christine, is yeah. did you ever see them arguing? I just have to ask, did you ever see him be, be I'm just going to ask it, be violent with her, anything like that? No. Okay. And, and the listeners should know the reason we're spending a, maybe a little more time than we usually would do on a, a you know, maybe an ex-boyfriend is that this is going to play uh, a role later in this conversation. Um, how long, of course, like you said, they were at least the way you understand it, you know, they were broken up at the time of her disappearance. How long were they a couple before it was this, like, final, what we might call the final breakup? How long were they a couple, you know, to your best guess? Well, let's see, it would be 86, summer, well, April, Easter of 86, um, mm -hmm. to, really, I mean, it's just December of 87, Okay, so like uh, over a year and a half. Okay, very good. Thank you. Uh, your perception, once again, as a 16-year-old, when she got out of that relationship, do you think that she was uh, eager to have another boyfriend? Of course, we hear about how people, you know, I got to spend some time on myself. What do you think her attitude was? She just wanted to have fun. Yeah. And that's when um, bumpers came in. I mean, mm -hmm. it was right after. Christmas, she was very devastated by this mm -hmm. um, breakup. She she wasn't, you know, she's. I don't I don't know what had you know what had happened outside mm -hmm. of that. It just just was that sensitive. I mean, I can remember her upstairs in my grandma's house, and she was very quiet, very still, very. Know how to mm -hmm. describe it. He was extremely down. Yeah. So um, going into the new year, she just looked and acted like she just wanted just some fun, and mm -hmm. fun meant to go to that dance club, which is age sixteen to twenty-one. All right, and it's called Bumpers. Mm -hmm. Okay, we're going to come back to Bumpers, and we're going to talk now about another guy here in a moment. But I think also the listeners need to understand, uh, because if they've looked at, of course, uh, leading up to this episode, episode I have um, you know, publicized it, put some articles out there, links to NamUs, and they know at the uh, on the day of her disappearance she was at work and coming home. What can you say about her jobs and her work schedule uh, at the time, you know, late of... 87 into 88. Uh, my understanding is she has two jobs, but maybe you can make that a little clearer. Yeah, um, she had a, a morning job at um, a boutique shop um, 
it's all in the same mall, actually. They weren't mm-hmm. connected at the same time, this boutique shop and Kmart, but um, put it this way, they're right next to each other. Okay. So um, she could just walk over. But as a boutique shop, um, I can't think of the name of it. Okay. Um, oh, Body and Soul. Body and Soul. Body and Soul. Okay. Mm-hmm. And she had that... Um, in the morning, and then she had a little bit of a break, and then she went um, to Kmart. Okay. And she was, uh, two jobs, very busy. Was she going to school, then mixed in there as well? No. No. really no time for that. Okay. Very good. So she had one job, she had the other job, and once again, I realize uh, you're not keeping tabs on her all the time, but how many hours would you say that she was working? Just to give an idea how busy she was, how many hours was she working, do you think, per week combined? Oh, I don't know. I, that's not run into my mind. Okay, would you <laughs> say that it was a reg, like, like a regular work week, what we might call 40 to 50 hours a week, or less than that? Any ideas? Um, please, probably 30 to 40. Okay, so that's a, like a decent that. amount of time. Okay. Mm-hmm. All right, so she was working these two jobs, one in the morning, one in the afternoon, evening, with a little break in between. I don't think that's unusual, uh, maybe for a lot of 19-year-olds, if they're, of course, um, I don't know if we want to call, uh, you know, look to get somewhere in their lives, saving some money, in contrast to just sitting home and playing video games, I guess. But I do want to ask you about one thing uh, that will come up later, but I just want to uh, put it in here. There is a story out there, and it's in the outline um, did you know at the time there was maybe somebody calling her at work? Did your family know about this? Or did you or your mother, anybody else know about this? And this person known as Dale, was this something you knew at the time before she went missing? Or is this something that came up after she went missing? Um. Any idea? I don't, I don't think I remember that part. Um. Mm-hmm. I think I was just in my own world. I yeah. Think, um, Sure. Um, I don't think I remember that. Okay. Um, I so think my mom would remember that, obviously. Yeah. Because she did bring up Dale um, the day before she went missing. Wow. So, um, okay. Uh, no. um, uh. Yeah, I don't remember her saying anything. I don't. Huh. Okay, that's fine. That's the best we can do. That's totally fine. And we will come back. I just want the listeners to know about this uh, person named Dale, and I I will ask you about it later once we get into the investigation afterwards. But somebody was uh, calling her, and we should know that Dale was not the name of her ex-boyfriend, correct? Correct. Okay, very good. All right, now you mentioned this place, Bumpers. And it was an under-21 club. I, I can tell you from my old days of living in Leechburg, Pennsylvania, we had a place in Lower Borough or New Ken called um, Fantasy Rock that we used to go to, under-21 club, so I know about that in the late 80s. Uh, maybe you can tell the listeners about going to this place and what you knew about Sue going to this place. And here uh, she met, a, 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 I guess you call it, a new guy at this place. Just Let's just talk a little bit about that. Okay, well, Sue and I, this would be the beginning of January. So I just want to, um, the time frame, it always surprises me. I just want to say that again is, um, or just say it. Yeah, please. Is talking about a two-week span here. We're not talking about months or a year. We're talking about two weeks and how fast this went. Yeah. Um, so when Sue and I went to Bumpers the first time, well, what do you do? You're just dancing. We're just having fun. We're sisters. It almost felt like old times um, because, you know, when people start, start, you know, after a breakup, I, I didn't know where I belonged. You know, mm-hmm. it's like, okay, she's really quiet, but she just seemed peppy or, you know, um, she just wanted to have fun and all of a sudden it's okay to hang out with your sister. So we just, um, it was just nice to be able to, you know, dance and have fun and, you know, felt great to hang out with her again. Yeah. And, you know, she hadn't changed 
really at all. It was just nice, and we were just just having fun. Um, and the second time that we went, then or no, wait, the first. Oh, I'm just trying to figure out when this. We were aware of him. Put it that way. Okay. Um, Bumpers guy. So um, he seemed to be pretty popular, and of course, you know he. Very easy to take notice of, you know. You just, I suppose, you know. I mean, every teenager wants to hang out with the popular <laughs> group, but always, yes. you know, it's like, well, we're gonna go back again. And we were, I remember being in the car and being all hyped up about finding a new place to hang out, and it was just really nice. And then we went there a second time, and you know, he started noticing Sue. And they danced and um, danced a couple times. And there was another um, guy that danced with Sue as well. So mm-hmm. um, I don't know his name, but it was a friend of um, the Bumper Sky. So, you know, she was having a lot of fun. I'm not dancing with anybody but myself. <laughs> <laughs> you know, um, uh-huh. it kind of lost that moment of sisterhood because mm-hmm. now she was she was um, interested in him, so um, typical teenager stuff. Okay, so after she met this guy and was dancing with him at this place called Bumpers, when you would leave that place, would you would she continue to like talk about him? You know, saying, "Well, I really like him." And do you know that when they weren't meeting at Bumpers, of course, like you said, this is just a few weeks from the beginning of January of '88 till she went missing in the middle of the month. Um, did he call her? Do you know if they ever went out on a date outside of meeting at Bumpers? Do you know anything about any of that? You know, my memory is just, I've been trying to think of what, I mean, I remember him calling Mm -hmm. and I, he came over once or twice, but I have really a faint memory of it. I just, I, my memory's kind of gone with that. How Sue disappeared. So that's fine. Um, it's it's kind of. And I, I'm trying to think, and I just can't. I mean, I put it this way: I know that he called. Okay. Um, that I'm a hundred percent sure. Okay, and you said that he at least came over to your house once. Maybe twice. Okay, so but he so he knew where Sue lived. Yes. Okay. Very good. All right. What did you uh, think of him? What did your mother think of him? And, of course, if it was an under-21 club, I'm guessing that he had to have been under-21, but he wasn't maybe 16. Was he, like, 20, 19, like Sue's age? I have no idea. I think he possibly could have even been older because his father owned the club. Oh. So I think he Okay. you know, been hanging out. I think he mm. possibly been older because he acted older. Right. But um, I don't know what, you know, in that age range. I, he just, I, you know, I have mm. thought of that. I have always thought he's a little bit older than 21, but I don't know. Okay, very good. Well, you make a good point that, you know, my understanding usually is that, you know, 21 clubs, they're usually a little hesitant about letting people, you know, 21 and over, because you don't know, don't know exactly what's going on there. But if his father was the owner of the club, I guess he could just do whatever he wanted. So I think that's a very good point you make, that he very well could have, he very well could have been 25 or something else. So for what, what all we know. All right. So he did come over to your house. Time of your life, I don't think you yeah. anything over 21 is old. <laughs> yes, that's right. Um, so, yeah. <laughs> okay. Gotcha. All right. So there's that. But he, I think the important part is that uh, he did know where uh, your family lived, where Sue lived. And once again, we'll come back uh, to him a little bit later. But you had told me something in you know, our prior two conversations, and we've had some back and forths through email as well, that Sue had something said something to your mother about how she Sue wanted your mother to meet someone. What do you remember about that? Do you think that she met this guy from Bumpers? Was it somebody else? Do you know do you, you know anything about that? What do you think about that now? Well, I mean, now 
now that, um, well, first of all, she did mention Adele the day before she went missing. Okay. She wanted, she wanted mom to meet him. Oh, and okay. And mom was like, yes, um, I'll meet him. Just be careful. And she was, you know, she was the typical teenager saying, yes, mom, you know, and, but she wanted mom to meet her meet him so um that was the only time i mean it was literally right on top of when she disappeared so as to who that person is i well, we have no idea as to who he is um it could have been um through the chat lines which by the way i just want to say something about the chat lines is yeah that's the equivalent of what we have now yeah. through facebook you know, Twitter, all of that, you know, mm-hmm. Instagram, all of the social media that we have now yeah. is um, the equivalent if you go backwards into that time or front, so, or forward. Mm-hmm. Yeah, maybe, uh, Christine, maybe I need to explain that. Uh, the demographic of the program, I'm thinking a, a large majority of the audience understand remembers what the chat lines were like in the late 80s, early 90s, but for the younger crowd... This was a, uh, a setup where you could dial like a 1-800 number or a 1-900 number, and it was like an open line. And you could get on this line and be talking to, and there would only allow so many people on the line at one time, but it would be like a group call, like we understand with our cell phones or Zoom or something now. But it was through landlines, that those phones that used to be hooked to the wall in your house. And you would get on there and talk to other people. Hopefully they're your age, but you know you would get some kooks on there too. And, but that's what it was. That's how people did social media in 1988. Right. And then if you go back even further, it would be the equivalent of a blind age. Yes. So that's right. That. <laughs> right. Okay. It's so weird to think that people used to do that back in the day. Uh, I t- know. Today, it would be like, what are you doing? Of course, with like Uber and Lyft, people are getting into cars with strangers all the time these days. Yep. So, okay. So that's. So Sue was on there um, as well, going to bumpers, just being a teenager. That's what teenagers did back then. Nothing unusual right. about all of this. Okay, so let me just ask you a few, like, kind of um, yes or no questions before we get into that day, January 19th, 1988. The car that she was driving the day that she disappeared, this Cutlass, was this the car that she usually drove? Yes, and oh. that was the family car. Okay, very good. And I already asked you about her work, but I'm going to I'm asking I'm going to ask you again. The to the best of your recollection, did Sue usually work at the same times every week? Yes. Okay, so her movements, I guess you could say would be predictable. Okay. All right, and uh, we've already kind of talked about uh, after the breakup, was she interested in dating anyone again? I would say the answer is yes, being that she's going to bumpers, she met this guy, and then there's this Dale guy. Maybe that's who she wanted your mother to meet. So it sounds to me like she was moving on from this breakup in in December, but I did forget to ask you one thing once again. If you don't know, Christine, totally fine. But at this breakup that occurred with the old boyfriend in December of 87, who instigated it? Did he break up with her? Did she break up with him? I have no idea. No idea. She never told you, and that's not something no. that's ever come up since very, then? Very quiet about it. Okay. I don't remember. I mean, actually, I just don't know. Mm-hmm. I, I don't. It could have been mm-hmm. um, possibly her reaction would be that he did. Um. That would be, and I'm just thinking back here, I mean, I I guess, yeah, it would have probably been him, and for what reason, I don't know. So, um, yeah, that would be the answer. Okay. I guess uh, maybe we can also maybe look at it this way. You said after the breakup that she was very quiet and maybe a little withdrawn, I have to tell you that would almost mean to me, sound to me like he broke up with her, but we we can't be sure. No. Okay, thank you. All right, so let's move up to January nineteenth, nineteen eighty eight. Maybe I could just ask you personally, what do you remember about that day? What were you doing that day? She, of course, went to work. What were you doing that day? Going to school. Going to school. <laughs> in the morning, you know. I mean, mom left earlier in the morning because she 
worked at the University of Minnesota, so she had to leave a lot earlier because she took the bus. Um, and I was just going to school. But, you know, we had breakfast in the morning. It was just something we just did okay. you know, for years. So yeah. nothing unusual. She was acting, you know, same thing. You're wearing my sweater. <laughs> ah. Very similar, you know, pretty much every morning. It was just the same thing. It was very, yeah. you say the word predictable. It's yeah. Predictable. I mean, there isn't anything different. Her mood, nothing. I mean, you just go off to school and you're, okay, well, it's just another day of school. Very good. Okay. So she goes to work, and you've already explained these two jobs. She would go to this boutique in the morning and work there for so many hours, I guess maybe three or four hours, and then take a break. She'd have some time off, but then she'd work at Kmart, which was very, like, in the same shopping center and maybe using the same parking lot, and she would then go to Kmart and work for a few hours. And at least this day, um, she worked until 4 o'clock, correct? Um, she worked until... Um, just before nine. Just before nine. Okay. Wow. Okay. Just before nine. And so she worked uh, until uh, just before nine. And tell the listeners what you remember about the weather that day. Um, well, I was able to get home. Um, mm -hmm. but, um, and mom was able to get home, but it slowly it started deteriorating mm -hmm. into... Um, a regular snowstorm, um, and then, um, you know, as the night went through, and the wind um, mm -hmm. through, like, Elmo being the country roads at that time, um, it went into whiteout conditions, into wow. a blizzard. So, oh, my. Um, I mean, all I know is that when I looked across the street, I could not see anything on the other side and there were buildings on the other side mm -hmm. I mean, we were basically downtown lake elmo so i mean mm -hmm. you couldn't see across the oh. street um and it was the wind was whirling around the house it was um something that i didn't want sue out in because yeah. she was always afraid of storms always since she was a kid and um it says Really, I'm the only one that would know that because I wonder how many storms mm -hmm. we were in. <laughs> yeah, it is Minnesota. She was always <laughs> beside herself, even yeah. as she got older. Um, it's just something that, you know, she would never want to be outdoors in. Mm -hmm. In those conditions. Okay, but... Of course, she's getting off at 9 o'clock, and the way you are explaining it is that she would have had to have driven through this, you said, whiteout conditions on the way home. Mm-hmm. Okay. I mean, I don't know what, given what I know about downtown Lake Elmo, I can't even imagine what it was like out, um, you know, out on the country roads there. Yeah. I mean, it would just be going straight across and um, make creating an extra whiteout. I don't know. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, it was near blizzard conditions anyway, so. Okay. All right, so not your uh, not very safe driving conditions, but it is Minnesota. Maybe people expect that, but she's 19, maybe not as an experienced driver as maybe a 40 no. or 50-year-old in those conditions, and a 1975 Cutlass is where we'll drive could get a little tricky. Okay, so when she doesn't arrive home at the, what the normal time would have been, Maybe you give, uh, maybe you and your mother give her a little, you know, leeway given the conditions and everything. Uh, when she didn't arrive back in what you thought was a reasonable amount of time, what went on between you and your mother waiting for her at home? That was miserable. I, bet. I mean, I, oh, I, I mean, I I know I went pretty hysterical. Um, mm. I was pacing a lot. Mom was pacing. We were looking out windows. Yeah. Um, any kind of noise, and we would be, you know, thinking it was Sue. Mm -hmm. um, it was, I mean, the time would go by, and it just, you know, eventually we called the police to go look for her. Yeah. I mean, my first thought was she was, you know, in a ditch somewhere. Of course. Like, go and find my sister, yeah. you know, it's like just 
get out there, um, which they did. You know, they were combing um, the highways and, you know, the highway, Highway 5, and, you know, even the back streets um, just to, because they didn't know um, if, you know, had she gone a certain, you know, like maybe the back road instead. So um, they were combing the areas and, you know, they were, nothing, mm. she wasn't showing up. I mean, I was just no. beside myself. And mom was always, she's always the, um, the strong one. I mean, she's, she's not showing I mean, you know that it's all clumped up inside of her. Um, all right. She's just trying to be strong for me. Um, well, let me ask you, maybe, Christine, mom. allow me to ask you some specific yeah. questions. When she didn't get home and what you thought would have been a reasonable amount of time, did your mother call Kmart? Of course, you maybe it would have been closing time. Maybe you know what he would be there. But do you remember calling Kmart? Do you remember calling maybe some of Sue's friends? Or maybe did she know any coworkers who she could have called? Did she try to call anybody when Sue right. didn't show up. Do you remember? Um, she did call Kmart to see. Um, I mean, first of all, to go track back is um, Sue had called me um, mm -hmm. at around 4 o'clock. Okay. And, um, you know, she's, she's fine. She's, you know, it's not, the weather isn't too wintry outside that she's not... Um, you know, worried or complaining or anything like that. She's talking about coming home, you know, in the way of, um, you know, having, you know, seeing a movie, that kind of thing. And we were just yakking about what kind of movie we were going to watch. And, you know, it's just mm -hmm. normal, regular um, day, just figuring it out. And then um, my mom had called um, when she, you know, was close to the time that um, she would have left and, you know, um, talking about what um, highway to go, you know, highway five, that she should take highway five because if anything, you know, like what happened, like um, issues with the car or anything like that, she would be able to be seen. Um, mm -hmm. as opposed to taking the back route in back of the mall where nobody could find her. She just wanted her to be safe. She wanted right. her to, you know, be seen if she had any problems at all. Right. Okay. So, and of course, you're very... Yeah. Okay. All right. So she was very worried. Uh, she does try calling Kmart. Of course, I, I don't think they, even if they picked up, I don't know how helpful they'd be. They probably just said, "Yeah, she left on time. We closed on time, and you know she's not still here." For all we know, she left at the usual time. Yeah. Uh, but her car, uh, the car, this 1975 Cutlass, and I'm going to put a picture of it. Not the exact car, I don't think, but a, a version of it, so people can have an idea what kind of car this is. Uh, the car, uh, her car, is eventually found. How was it found? Where was it found? Uh, we'll, we'll just start with that. It was found at the gas station. So, um, mm -hmm. and, what's the inter what is the intersection, if you can say, maybe just the cross streets or an approximate address there, Christine? Right. The intersection is Manning and Highway 5, which I think is Stillwater Boulevard at that time, but um, it's Highway 5. Okay, thank um, you. Manning and Manning. So okay. There's a new station there, a holiday station, but yeah, it's at the corner, that corner. Okay, very good. And uh, who found this car? Was it just happened upon by accident or or what? Um, a deputy found um, the car. Okay, was it that night or was it the next day? It was actually the next day. Okay, all right, so you had to... You had to, uh, you know, worry. Of, of course, you're still worried to this day, but as far as... Maybe it was in the middle of the night. Maybe. I don't know. Okay. It was, you know, within that time. I don't remember. Okay. Um, all right, so... All right, so Sue doesn't get home. Your mother eventually, after maybe calling her work, maybe calling a couple other people, finally alert the police. They put a bee on the lookout. 
and maybe given the wintry conditions and everything, they're pro they're probably thinking hey, maybe she did spin off somewhere. Would not be unusual. That's happening all the time. And so they're on the be on the lookout, and somebody, a uh, police officer, law enforcement officer, cruising around the area sees her car at this parked in this gas station at Manning and Highway Five. Okay, and uh, just to ask you, if you don't know these questions, totally fine, but I have to ask them. Do you remember if they ever told you, uh, was the car locked? Obviously, there was no signs of Sue, anything unusual about the car, at least the way it was parked. We'll get into other things later. But at the time, was the car locked? Anything unusual about it, looking at it from the outside? Um, the car was locked, and I just found out that out a year ago. Huh. Yeah, sure. Um, so it was locked with all of her belongings inside, which would be a purse, mm. um, her glasses, um, mm. her ID, um, pretty much everything <laughs> okay. that she had um, all right. was in there. So, okay. All right, so the car is found. Obviously, she is not. Uh, over the next few days, week, uh, what do the police do? I realize you're 16. Of course, you're not following them around. They're doing their own work. But what is your understanding of what they did at the time in January of 1988? Uh, reflecting back or at the time? At the, what did you know at the time? Yes, what did you know at the at time? The time? At the time, I didn't feel like they were doing enough. I mean, I was mm. very mad at them. Okay. Um, um, I never, I didn't know what the procedures were yeah. of anything like this. So, um, I didn't know that, you know, if there was an officer in the house and then somebody, you know, people going out and looking for her, you know, if somebody was in the house, I was mad because they're not out there. So I didn't know how that worked. So, mm -hmm. um, they were looking only to a point and then assuming she was a runaway. So they did not interview her friends. Mm -hmm. They didn't interview. Um, they did interview, obviously, the gas station attendant. Okay. And they did a sketch um, of the person. Okay. We'll, so, we'll certainly talk about that in a bit. But So they were talking to some people. Yes. I mean, okay. they were... Obviously, they were talking to the manager at Kmart. Mm -hmm. They were talking to um, the uh, manager of the boutique, just to go back a little yeah. bit on that, just to see what her hours were, what the day kind of felt, you know, even though it was um, a predictable day. They just wanted to know. They wanted to really know where she was, and she was at both places in in that day as, you know, predicted, and, you know, she, they took note, or the manager took note that she had changed during the day to hmm. a skirt, which was very typical of her, um, as not a mini skirt, it is just a regular skirt, one to the knees, so it's not a mini skirt, mm -hmm. but, um, so they were doing, they were doing that tracking back. Um, I don't know if that was the next day or um, obviously the gas station attendant and the sketch was doing that next day to get the, the best information of, you know, with the car and all that. So, oh. um, so it was, you know, within that week they were tracking back on that day. Okay. All right, so they're trying to do what they can, talking to a lot of people that uh, make sense. We're going to get into a, a few more of those details a little in-depth, a little deeper here in a moment. So this car is there, and like you said, all of our stuff, we're going to get that to that in, in a moment. So let's move on to this. Let's go back to this car. Um, the, the way you understand the way she would have been driving from Kmart to go home, was this gas station a, a place that she, this is an intersection she would have gone through? Yes. 
Okay, so she's not out of her way, wasn't in the opposite direction, would have been on her way. Uh, how close was the car when it, at this gas station? Is that closer to your house or is it closer to Kmart? About halfway. She's a little far, but she's a more closer to our house. Okay. Approximately. She's within, she's within <coughs> oh, I don't know, miles. That's all right. That's all right. Put it this way. She's closer to our house. Okay. So the car being at this gas station was closer to your house. Uh, we won't do miles then. How long do you think it would have taken to drive? Of course, we know it's winter conditions, so that's really going to slow anything down, everything down. But on a normal day... How long do you think it would take uh, to drive from that Kmart to your house? Normal day. Because she took the back route, it would probably be um, 15 minutes. So pretty close. Yeah. All right, pretty close. So the car then was less, maybe five, only five minutes away from your house. Something like that. Five, six, seven, whatever. Okay, I just... All right, yeah. what we're saying is... Yeah, you know, uh, she was, seemed like she was on her way home, and so we're going to bring on um, to this next point was probably one of the most perplexing parts of this, in, other than her being missing, is the, the status of this car. So the car is there, but when the car was um, analyzed a little more, more closely after it was taken away from the, the garage, uh, away from this gas station, there was something in particular that was discovered about uh, the radiator for the car. What can you tell the listeners about that? Um, it, it was thought of that somebody had to get under her car and um, take something about the pet cock yeah. it. So, um, so she was having car trouble that night. Huh. So what she had told the gas station attendant was correct. So, um, yeah, so it was the pet cock that was loosened. All right, so what you're saying, Christine, just to put it very bluntly, it looked like somebody had tampered with the car. Yes. Wow. Okay, and then the... The, the pet cock, which is on a radiator, I don't even know if, I don't know if they're on radiators in 2022, but at the time in, uh, the, you know, in the 1970s, 1980s, is there would be like a kind of drain plug on the radiator that, you know, if you wanted to change the, the, the coolant, you could do it very quickly, and there was something at the bottom of the radiator, you could unscrew this thing and all the coolant would come out. What you're saying is that was, uh, that uh, had been loosened and seemingly all the coolant came out of the radiator. Right. Okay, so now we're getting now so that's uh, of course going to get everybody's attention. Um was was this car eventually fixed? Yes. Okay. We <clears throat> we needed it. All right, and um the reason this is important if I could just talk for a second, I think it's important for all the listeners to understand is that even though the coolant had drained out of the car, seemingly by being tampered with, seemingly, that it, the car wasn't damaged to the point that it couldn't be fixed. All it needed to be done was coolant put back in it, and you could drive it again. It did not blow up the engine, which would eventually happen if you drive a car without any coolant in it. But it seems that the perception is that Sue is driving it, maybe a, you know, a red light back at the time, a 75 Cutlass, a red light would come on saying there's a overheating problem, she pulls into this uh, this gas station, but she got to it. She shut the car off before it damaged the engine, and so uh, the car could be fixed, and you and your mother could go back to driving it. In contrast, the engine getting blown up, and you'd have to get a new car. Okay. Right. All right. Thank you, Christine. Uh, I just wanted to uh, – sometimes when I ask some of these questions, sometimes maybe the listeners don't know where I'm going with it, but that's where I was going with it. Okay. And so you continued to drive that car a bit. To your knowledge, did the police uh, do any kind of forensics on the car? Did they um, do any fingerprints, uh, anything, to your knowledge? No, not mm -hmm. of my knowledge. No, okay. they okay. didn't. Okay, so, all right, so that's the car. And let's just go back to go over once again um, what was in the car in your opinion, was everything that um, Sue would have been carrying that day inside the car, her purse, ID, uh, what about the keys? What about those items? That would have been everything that she would have needed. 
mean, mm-hmm. there was money in there, too. So, mm-hmm. I mean, not a lot, but, you know, um, mm-hmm. typical of what she's carrying. So, mm-hmm. um, everything that she would to identify herself was in there. Mm-hmm. Being that you said earlier that the... So, you know, something that she can't live without. Right. Being that you said earlier in this conversation that the car was locked, uh, what about the keys for the car? Were they inside the car, or are the keys also missing with Sue? The keys are missing. Okay, mm-hmm. all right. So we have these items uh, that are in the car. The car is locked, uh, but the keys are missing. Maybe that makes sense. Of course, people are going to think about, you know, why would she lock the car and leave, but leave her purse and other things that she would normally carry with her? That's uh, probably going to be something that uh, people are going to think about. I'm sure you've been thinking about this all all these years as well. Now, you have mentioned, yeah, as you have mentioned, though, luckily, I guess, there was a witness. What can you say about this witness? And in fact, uh, I think you even said that this witness spoke to Sue once she pulled in there. What can you tell the listeners about this witness, what he saw, and, um, you know, all about that? What can you say? Sue obviously was having car trouble. Um, The um, gas station attendant saw her come in to um, the gas station um, parking lot and saw her park on the side of the gas station, and she did come in and reported that she was having car trouble, and the gas station attendant, she said that um, she could leave, Sue could leave the car there as long as she parked into another area, so obviously the snowfalls would be coming through. Mm-hmm. So, sure. in the meantime, she was, um, somebody else had come in and was um, pretty close into where Sue was coming in, and he was... Um, coming in close. I mean, we don't know if maybe he was because there was a blizzard using her back lights um, or any sort of lights um, to just come into the gas station with her. Um, a lot of people use their um, other people's lights to um, follow mm-hmm. through a blizzard. So somebody else had come in at the same time. And um, Sue had um, started talking to him, and um, she got into the car with him, and that's when they were seen um, heading in our direction, which would be Highway 5 to Otter Boulevard at that time. So, um, yes, the gas station attendant had talked to Sue, and it was about that car trouble. Okay. So... The, the, so I guess what we're saying is this witness's perception, this person who worked at the gas station, is that Sue got into this other car willingly. Um, she, yes. che- she wasn't abducted. She opened the passenger side door, got in. Yes. Okay. Uh, when, just to maybe even get a little more technical on this, is that when... Um, she went in there to talk to this gas station person. Uh, did she ask, like, where, of course, this was the era before phones, cell phones. Did she ask, like, where the pay phone was, or did she ask just to use a regular phone to, you know, call? No. Anything no. like that? No. Okay. Because she had just talked to us. Okay, she had just talked to you, right, and I will, I will come back to that in a bit, but... I guess the reason I'm asking that is being that she was going to obviously be, de- be delayed, I thought that she might have you know, said, you know what, I better call my mom just to make sure she doesn't right. start worrying about me. But that did not come up seemingly in this conversation with this witness. No, I think at that point she thought mm-hmm. if she took a ride um, with somebody to get home, she'd mm-hmm. be home really fast. Right, so okay. That's, that is... That is what we have thought. Mm-hmm. Okay. I guess uh, what I'm thinking about now is, you know, it, she, she, she maybe couldn't have known that that car was going to come along. Maybe she thought, well, I'm going to walk out to my car and get my things and come back inside and then call. Maybe. Mm-hmm. Okay. Mm-hmm. All right. Now, you did mention a little earlier in this, uh, in this uh, conversation that we're having here that 
uh, this witness did get to uh, see who was driving this other car um, and even, so, of course, saw the, the car itself. How did this witness describe the car, this other car? but it was white and I guess it was from you know all that all the snow that turns black um, yeah. you know anywhere you know from the storms and just being around the cities of course. Um, that kind of dirty um, which all cars get so um, and for his description it would be um, tall um, with kind of like a shoulder type length hair with a hat Kind of like a beanie hat. Okay. Uh, and um, shoulder length hair, but the hair that kind of cups behind, which I'm trying to think of the name of that hairstyle at the time, um, but very, very popular, but tall and thin, mm. and um, wearing kind of like a bomber jacket type of black kind of bomber type jacket and. Um, mm -hmm. Things and you know, you know, she's just looking out there and she's seeing what she sees in the middle right. of a blizzard. But, sure, it's tough. Uh, we don't know, you know. Yeah. We're just going by that kind of description. So right. obviously, she's looking out the window because she, you know, you know, she she has to because mm. people are pumping gas. So right. Right, and of course, there's no way this gas station uh, person could have known that Sue was going to go missing. Maybe she knew if there was some sort of crime taking place, she would have paid more uh, closer attention. And what we've always believed and would believe to be, because um, Sue, we're going back to her personality, is she's going to trust anybody to mm -hmm. give her a ride home. Um, okay. We've always been under you know, the thought that, she, you know, he offered her a ride home. Okay. So that would seem to make sense. Yeah, and she would she would take that ride. Okay. I guess what we're also oh. saying, being that this witness uh, said that this guy was tall, is it wasn't like he just sat in the car. He actually got out of the car. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. And the, 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 the listeners should know, you actually or some, maybe your mother, or somebody actually spoke to this gas station person recently. Yes, that would be me. That would be you. And so you've kind of uh, kept in touch with this person, or how, how does that no, all work? No, this is the first time uh, I've ever spoken to her, and I wow. found her actually through um, the responses off of my Spidel Strong page on Facebook, mm -hmm. and people are busy sharing, so... I always go through all of who is shared and what the comments are because you never know who you could find or somebody says something. Um, and she said that I should know I was the gas station attendant. So I'm, <laughs> that's how I found her. So we spoke about um, a month, month and a half ago. Okay. So and like at the uh, beginning of 2022. Yeah, okay. and it was really interesting to talk to her, but she has a lot of blanks in her mind, I mean, mm. um, of, in her memory, because, I mean, 30 years, 34 years, Right. Um, where, where were you 34 years ago at a gas station to remember anything, so she's, she's had the police talk to her quite frequently. And her memory is starting to, um, even though she's had to recall this quite a bit, her memory is starting to um, go. All right, so we have this witness, and I think it's spectacular, Christine, that you're, you got in touch with this person. I think it's great that mm -hmm. you're having this communication, no matter if it is 34 years later, or maybe this person's memory is deteriorating over time as I guess all of ours eventually will but I think it's excellent that you got back in contact with this person I think that's really good 
Let's, uh, and the listeners will have to think about all of that. So let's move on to this. Now, you didn't, um, I think something is going to maybe need a little more explanation, and then we're going to lead into why this is so important. You mentioned earlier in this conversation that, um, that I don't know if uh, Sue told you this on the phone at four o'clock, or maybe uh, her, her boss told you this from Kmart, but here it was snowing a blizzard out, but she changed back into a skirt to go outside. Can you explain that maybe a little bit more? You're the person who knew Sue the best. Can you explain that? Well, I was thinking about that the other night, and I've been thinking about it for 34 years. That would be a, probably a change out to her clothes um, to, from the boutique. So you had to um, dress a certain way there, or you couldn't. Uh, she wouldn't have worn her red outfit there. She would have wanted to wear her skirt. Um, so she's just changing back to that. Mm. Um, after being at Kmart for four or five hours or whatever, how much time that was, I would imagine she would want to change to mm. that. So she's mm. just going right back to the boutique um, mm -hmm. outfit. So. You know, it dawned on me again, you know, and it has before, but it just dawned on me that that is probably the initial outfit that she wore that day, obviously, mm -hmm. but she wanted to go back into it. So I don't see that as, I mean, it doesn't, you know, I mean, the manager had told the police that he did think that that was unusual, mm -hmm. but that's also Sue. Okay. Not to be unusual, but to be... I don't want to be in this Kmart outfit. Ah. You know, it was it was her own yeah. outfit. I mean, sure. Just to make it clear, some people, just because I haven't been able to describe it myself, mm -hmm. that isn't uniform or anything like that. That was an outfit that she had put together. So just to um, make sure people know that. Very so, good. Um, anyways... I suspect she just went right back to the other outfit. So. Okay. So in you once again, you're in your opinion, you were the person who knew her best at the, t at the time. Her changing back into the skirt does not seem unusual to you. It never. It was never a red flag for me. No. Okay, because uh, I think maybe when you mentioned it earlier, what might have gone through people's minds is, well, you know, she's changing back into a skirt, maybe she's going to meet somebody. But that's not how you interpret it. Um, not at the time, not at all. Okay. So it was, it was pretty typical, even in different weather, for her to change a couple times. So no, that it was, I didn't tune mm. into that because I just was wanting her home. Right, I wasn't of course. I wasn't into outfits. It's, when you start grappling things a year or later, or two, three, whatever, um, you start looking in on what she was doing, obviously. Mm. Mom, much, much more. Right. But for me, it's, you know, those little details did not stick out at all. That's typical. Okay, very, typical. very good. Now, as far as her, as you mentioned, she called you earlier in the day. I think maybe you said somewhere around 4 o'clock in the afternoon. Was this unusual, or is that pretty standard that she would call you, like, in between jobs or, or whenever? Pretty common? That's pretty common for her. Mm -hmm. Okay. So it's not unusual at all. Okay, and that conversation you had with her, nothing that sticks out to you as being unique? No. Okay. It's typical stuff. <laughs> okay, great. All right, so, and the reason this skirt is important is because we're going to move on to this other, this next topic, which, uh, as I think you know, Christine, the, the listeners uh, surely know, that we've covered over 240 disappearances now, and this upcoming uh, piece of our conversation has to be one of the most unusual, very unique, very rare uh, type of facts we're going to be talking about, but I'm glad we talked about the skirt and her changing, because now we're, uh, we're you know, kind of maybe going to you know, put this all together. So we had, of course, she goes missing. It is still unsolved 34 years later. Um, we have this witness, this guy, she gets into this car. But then 
somehow you'll have to explain this from for to the listeners. The pants that she was wearing that day, once the one the ones that she changed out of, I guess from Kmart, ended up in your house. How was that discovered? Where were they discovered? You know, please explain how that all went down in 1988. The pants were found, the whole outfit was found under her bed, which was not seen beforehand. So Mom had, and I had gone through um, everything mm -hmm. and to, to see if there was anything unusual. Nothing was out of sorts. Nothing looked like it was like a mad dash to get anything. Like if, you know, when they were assuming that she was a runaway. Mm -hmm. And first of all, first and foremost, she's not a runaway. Mm -hmm. um, but again, you know, we are going through the motions of what the police want us to do is to see if there's anything out of, you know, looking like it's been moved around. Um no, none of that, and none of her, you know, regular items that she would move around were not moved around, you know, mm -hmm. um, just like earrings, that kind of thing, so makeup, all that, everything's in place where it's supposed to be. She's a neat freak, so everything is <laughs> really, really um, put together, so she's not, there's nothing you know, moved around, jostled, nothing. So, um... Then how were, how, then how were the then, pants found? I, it seems to me that, that they would be weird to be found underneath the bed. Exactly. So then that second time that we had gone through the room, we looked, or I looked under the bed, and there was her outfit, and that was kind of rolled up and thrown. So again, she's very neat person so seeing something rolled under a bed mm -hmm. and it's her outfit freaked us both out and we told the police right away mm -hmm. so um yeah they you know but we'll go into the police later they didn't pick up that outfit until 10 years later until she they figured out that um she may not be a runaway yeah. so it was you know that's a whole nother story, but mm -hmm. um, if so, we just kept um, kept it, and obviously, and kept it in um, her room, and mm -hmm. there wasn't anything like no DNA, no nothing back then done. So. Are are we sure? I once again, I just have to make sure, just so the listeners understand. Are you one hundred percent sure that this outfit, the pants, and, and the rest? Um, is what she was wearing that day, 100%. Yes, because she wow. was seen it um, in the outfit um, mm -hmm. at Kmart. Um, and when the gas station, or I mean the, um, the manager at Kmart was asked what she was wearing, yeah. that was what she was wearing. Oh, my goodness. So, yes, you know. Okay, so... When and the best guess, I realize it's been thirty-four years. The best guess you can give is how much, how long after her disappearance did you come across those items? Oh, that was within um, a week. A week. A week after she was missing. Okay. Now there's something else that kind of goes along with this that um, maybe you didn't exactly put it all together at the time, obviously maybe after you found her, her outfit or Kmart outfit that it finally came into, you know, a uh, view, you know, it became very clear, but you told me that there were, um, for some reason there were dirty dishes in the sink and there was what you would call a, a marijuana slash weed smell, uh, at the same time in your house. Did, was that what tipped you off? Maybe something had gone on in the house when you and your mother were gone. What can you say about that? Yes, when I got home from school that day, the, first of all, the key is always put in the same place, always. I mean, even if we were, you know, run, running fast to work or school, we just mm -hmm. threw it in that little area, pocket area. So um, it was not, when I came home, I wasn't in that area. So I had to really, really look, and I finally came across it. It was on the, almost the other side of the room. So um, mm -hmm. I got in and 
there was a really sweet smell. Now, none of it, <laughs> Sula and I were very straight. We're not um, smokers, we're not drinkers, nothing like that. So it just is a very, very odd, sweet smell, pungent sweet. So, and, you know, I was just looking around in the kitchen and because it was so strong, and I looked into the sink, and there were dishes. Now, Sue and I had had breakfast um, that morning, so bowls would be in there and spoons. But there were a few plates in there. So um, that's when I started freaking out. That's when I called Mom, and that's when she was able to get a ride home from one of her coworkers to get home faster. Mm-hmm. So um, then we kind of... We started going up to Sue's room, and um, that's when we started going through mm. her room to see if there's, yeah. you know, get the feel if there's anything, you know, changed in her room or changed in the living room or anything. And no, it didn't, it didn't, you know, mm-hmm. nothing had change except for when we had started combing Sue's room and that's when we found the outfit. Okay, so what you're what you're saying is uh, it, it seems like while you and your mother were gone, maybe she's at work, you're at school, somebody who had something to do with Sue's disappearance, uh, I, I, somebody uh, came in, knew where the spare key was uh, kept outside of your house, yes. went inside, had this outfit, threw it under her bed, and then while was there was smoking marijuana and eating off your plates with your utensils. Yes. I mean, wow. it, that is the most wow. crazy. I mean, I, to this day, I have no understanding of it. I mean, I'm literally... Yeah. Always the 15 year old walking in and not understanding what I'm smelling, what's going on. I'm so glad that my mom was able to get back. But in the meantime, before I was pretty much in the corner of the dining room, I did not want to handle anything. Um, mm-hmm. Tried to call a couple of my friends, and of course they were gone. So I was handling a lot of it by myself in the house and I wanted out of the house so except you know the weather was not something I would want to be in and I I didn't want to leave the house but at the same time I didn't want to be in the house so Mm -hmm. (laughs) there's a lot that I was dealing with by myself right Um, let me let me ask you this Christine ever before this time of uh, this outfit of Sue's ending up in your house and all these dishes and the smell, ever before that day or after that day, had you had you ever thought or did you ever think that somebody had been in your house or is this the only day in your life that you ever thought that? This is the only day that I felt like somebody had been in the house. Mm-hmm. I never, never felt like, I mean... The only other person that could have been in the house is landlord. Mm-hmm. Okay. And he was an older man, and that would be if something was, he was always kind of in the house mm-hmm. and, you know. Mm-hmm. So. Yeah, but we're not thinking that the landlord had anything to do with Sue's disappearance, correct? No. <laughs> okay, no. so we have to believe that this outfit ending up underneath her bed and these dishes and everything are all done by the same person. That would make the most sense. Yes, and somebody who Mm -hmm. knew where the key was. Yeah. And, you know, obviously knew where her house was, knew where the key was, um, Mm -hmm. just felt comfortable, somewhat comfortable in the house. Of course. Uh, Once again, the way you remember it back in 1988, how many people knew where this spare key was? Obviously, you, your mother, Sue, the landlord, anybody else, to your knowledge? One. One other person? One other person, possibly 
Possibly two. Okay. And there could have been, Sue's friends may have known, so that would mm -hmm. have been two more. So, mm -hmm. four. Okay, four more people I besides the obvious it ones. People right in the, like, Sue's girlfriends yeah. would know. They've been over at the house. Her ex-boyfriend was in, you mm -hmm. know, <clears throat> they were going in and out of the house, so, you know, that would be the only door that we go through. Mm -hmm. So, okay. Yeah, so about four. Okay. And when you say these two, do you mean the ex-boyfriend, the one she broke up with in December. How about the new guy from Bumpers? And we're going to talk about these guys here in a little bit. But would the guy from Bumpers have known where that key was? Possibly. But I don't know. Okay. Very strange. I, 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 I got to tell you once again, Christine, that is one of the... Um, as uh, uh, perplexing facts uh, I've run across in 240 disappearances, so that's saying quite a bit. And I'm sure the listeners are going to um, be thinking hard about that. And, of course, you've been thinking about it very hard for 34 years, as I'm sure your mother has. Okay, yeah, but we... I mean, I've, please. Yeah, I've, yeah, I've talked to so many people, just friends, neighbors, community, about that particular, and they... <laughs> We're always just, we just don't even get it. We don't understand mm -hmm. that part, but that okay. is the part. That's part of the story. So yeah. that's part of what happened. And we haven't, you know, that's part of the 34 years of not knowing. Right. Let's move on to this. So we have this witness who uh, will come back to this witness, but you had mentioned that this witness saw this guy. You've already actually already... Um, kind of explained what this guy looked like, and uh, by the time everybody's hearing our voices, I will have posted a sketch of this uh, man that the the gas station person saw, and this guy who got out of the car, and uh, you know how he looked and what he was wearing. Uh, who does that in your? Once again, this is just your opinion, Christine. Who does that sketch look like? That would be the bumpers guy. It does. That's in your opinion. He looks like the guy that she had just met um, a couple weeks before that. That would have been within two weeks. Mm -hmm. um, that was that was the person that she was talking about. But it could have been the Dale that um, she had spoken about with mom the day right before. So okay. I don't know what he looks like, and mom doesn't, but, so, there's two people, um, mm -hmm. one that I hadn't seen, and mom hadn't seen, that could have been close to that description, but for me, um, mm -hmm. the minute that I saw him, I had to slap that poster backwards, I didn't want to see it, it was, but I mm -hmm. told everybody that that's who, who it is. Okay, so your opinion, once again, when you saw the sketch back in 1988, you immediately thought it looked like the bumpers guy. Yes. Okay, thank you. Um, did, the, did the police ever, and you, once again, to your knowledge, did they ever go and talk to this bumpers guy, this uh, however old he was, 20 years old, 25 years old, did they ever speak to him, and have you ever been told what his alibi is for that day? Yes, they've talked to him many, many times, but he seems mm. to, you know, he does have an alibi. He does, um, overall, his um, record does not look good, as meaning mm. that he has had issues with yeah. money, women, that kind of thing. So he's, he's not, the police have dubbed him that he's always in the wrong place, um, the wrong place at the mm. wrong time, however that goes. Um, that, you know, I mean, he's, he's taken lie detector tests, although we all know that, you know, you can pass those. You can, sure. Um, mm -hmm. So he has passed those, um, but my gut, and I always, but the police tell me not to, you know, they want to make sure that I don't want, or don't zero in on him so much that I don't think outside of him. Sure. Which I don't understand that, 
because my gut and my knowledge of who I saw at bumpers and who he, you know, I can see him in the sketch, that should be 100% taken in and looked at again and again and again. It should be pushed as much as it can until, you know, but if he is, if he isn't, this, this is what it, they're talking about. If it isn't him and somebody else, and they're making sure that I'm not, you know. Yeah. Um, it's very hard as yes. a sister. Yes, of course. When you see something um, that really wonder if it is, and I right. here I've known the whole time that this is the person, and nobody took me seriously enough. Okay, and well, that, all we can say yeah. is though, you know, to stay on the sketch. Your opinion: yeah. the guy that picked her up that day looks like this guy from the bumpers. In, do, does anybody yeah. know? Of course, you, the, the the gas station person, also saw the car that he was driving. Do you know if they've ever been able to attach that car to this bumpers guy, that type of car, that color of car? Any idea? The type, yes, yeah. because I had Meg wheels, mm -hmm. which I don't know if it was a big thing back then, but the car description fit somewhat of this description. It's not 100%. I mean, she had to go through, the gas station attendant had to go through um, many pictures of cars, mm -hmm. and she had to pick out what it looked like to, you know, to whatever she remembered. Um, and, you know, then they started coming up with um, the make, possible makes, that kind yeah. of thing. So, um, it closely fits it closely fits the car that the bumpers guy would have been driving at the time. Yes. Okay. Let's move on to this. Seems like a pretty good lead, but on the other hand, this disappearance is unsolved. This guy has never been charged with anything regarding um, Sue's disappearance, so we just have to keep that in mind. But I, I, I think that Christine has made her point, that her opinion that the sketch does look like this guy. And so we have to think about that. Now, let's talk about the ex, this guy from December. Um, what did he have to say about Sue's disappearance? Did you ever talk to him at the time? Of course, you and he are around the same age. Did you talk to him about Sue's disappearance? What did he have to say? And maybe if we're going to talk about that sketch, does he look like the guy in the picture? No. Does not? He doesn't have the height. Um, hmm. He's not slim, and yes, we talked quite a bit. Um, mm -hmm. Over the years, we have talked quite a bit, but not, um, of course, I mean, he always tries to go on with his life, but he's very affected by his case because, mm. I mean, that was young love. You don't forget that. Yeah. Um, but um, lately, no, we have really pretty much disconnected. I think it's no. just too hard to talk about, and it's really important for him to go on in his life, and hopefully mm. he can. But um, it's just too too emotional. Um, it's It doesn't feel... Um, it doesn't feel supportive. It feels different again. It just... It doesn't... Um, I don't know how to describe it. I just... Hopefully he can go on. Do you know, uh, even though he doesn't look like the sketch and we're not, we're not sure what to make of that, did, did the police talk to him? Did, um, did he, has he ever offered up his own um, theory as to what could have happened to Sue? Do you know anything about that? Has he ever said, well, I think this happened to her? Yeah, um, he's talked to the police quite a bit. And they have been talking to him you know, it seems like, you know, even a couple of years ago, they were, in mm. 2018, they were going around and interviewing everybody again, being at the third year. They wanted to make sure that they go, went straight back to, you know, the first person, obviously, the gas station attendant, um, and went all the way up through the family, through, um, you know, try to pull that together again with new eyes. Um, mm. 
and a new team, and um, we're still coming short. But back to um, Sue's boyfriend is, um, yeah, he's talked to the police quite a bit. And um, what was the other question? I was asking you, being that, uh, you know, we don't do theories on the program, but I know that the listeners are going to get the idea that you certainly, uh, you know, seem to think that this bumpers guy is the best suspect. Have you ever talked to this ex about this bumpers guy? And has he ever, you know, offered up his own opinion about what you think? And has he ever offered up his own theory? Well, over, I mean, just from the get-go, he mm-hmm. knows that you didn't run away. Mm-hmm. I mean, he knows that sensitivity in her personality, all of that. But when it comes to the bumpers guy, I mean, he he questioned it if it was him. Um, he wondered, obviously. Um, you know, again, we're in and out of communication. I mean, we mm-hmm. were, it was pretty obvious that we were going to be talking um, quite a bit in the early years, but now it's, you know, I don't know what he's thinking now, but back then he, he really wondered if it was the bumpers guy okay. as well, but th- he was not a part of the dancing yeah. part of it. He wasn't, he wasn't the third person there dancing, so huh. he wasn't, he's going strictly by what mom and I describe. So, Um, I don't think they ever met, but he's going by um, Sue's personality trait. Okay. Now, did he tell you at one time, I have it in some of my notes, maybe I got it wrong, but you can correct me. Did he say on the day that Sue went missing that she was going to see him? Did he say that? um, Or him, yes. Now, I didn't know about that until the podcast came out for Still Missing podcast, Hmm. um, he mentioned that they were still together. Trust me, I would have known. (laughs) Um, I absolutely, that is a complete lie. Um, I don't know. Mm -hmm. I don't even understand that part of, um, I mean, like I said, there was quite a few years after Sue went missing that mom and I were still in contact with them because, you know, that was Sue's boyfriend. So we didn't want to really lose that connection. But, you know, he had never mentioned that in those years, you know. And again, I would have known. Mom would have known. We would have known. So she was living... um, and, you know, she was living at home. We would have known. No. Okay. So, so We're obviously not. this, so I guess what you're saying, and I didn't know this until you just said it, that uh, this ex-boyfriend has been interviewed by some other program, and mm-hmm. what he has said are things that don't line up for, with what you think. Exactly. Okay. Exactly. All right. Well, I guess he gets to get his word out there, but that's one more reason that here at Unfound, we rarely, except if it's, if it's Steve Pankey, which is a whole other case, uh, we usually do not talk to people who might even close to be considered uh, suspects in any disappearance. So, um, you know, because some, sometimes they start telling stories. But okay, so he said on some other program that he believed that Sue was going to see him the day she disappeared, but from all what you understand, she's your sister. She was going directly home that day. Okay. All right, so let's move on to this. You just mentioned him a few minutes ago, and we can talk about him now. This is this guy, Dale. We talked about him very early in the conversation. It seems like he was calling her uh, at her work, calling Sue at work. Did the police track him down? Uh, My understanding is that they did, and what did they find out about him? I don't... I don't think they had found Dale, but they had found um, one of the people that Sue had talked with. Again, these are through the chat lines. Mm-hmm. So one of the person, there was a sketch um, right next to Sue's phone. Um, and I, you know, I must have looked at that drawing for years and didn't understand it. And um, turns out at the 30-year 
one of the, um, Sue's friends looked at it and said that Sunray Shopping Mall. <laughs> you know, um, there's mm. the sun, and it looks like, you know, I mean, she had worked at Sunray um, Shopping Mall at once upon a time. It was like, oh, well, I guess it was 87, because the Twins won um, the World Series. So, yeah, it would have been early 87 that she had worked there. So, anyways, the sketch was by the phone. Um, so hmm. that was one of them. But that was not Dale. Huh. And that didn't go through, but the police was able to, um, you know, find him, track him down, see. Um, I don't know how they do it, but mm -hmm. <laughs> they were able to find um, him. But I don't know about anybody else. And I, I don't, I haven't heard anything about Dale. But again, the family doesn't know who yeah. they're interviewing. They, they don't. You know, right. All right, so uh, I guess I have uh, got it wrong in my notes then. So your understanding then, as of February 2022, is this guy Dale, who uh, was calling her at work, uh, was not found, was never identified conclusively? Not that I know of. Okay. So then who was, do you think, was the guy that Sue wanted to introduce your mother to, being that we talked about that before? Who do you think that was? Oh, so it's the same guy. Mm -hmm. But yeah. still, he still, even though, once again, just so uh, we can be clear on this, she, your belief is that when Sue said that, she meant Dale, but even all these years later, Dale has never been identified. Not that I know of. Wow. Now, this other guy, though, that was tracked down, uh, did you tell me that he ended up being married? Yes. He did, okay. He was, he was one of the people that just comb, you know, would be now the internet for, mm -hmm. you know, girls that they want to go out with, and they, they say they're not married, you know, yeah. all of that, so, right. you know. Right. Okay. All right, so I guess, listeners, what we're saying is we have the bumpers guy, and uh, who Christine obviously uh, has strong feelings about. We have the ex-boyfriend. You can never rule out an ex-boyfriend in any disappearance until I think the disappearance is solved unless he, he, you know, he can prove that he was like on the moon or something at the time of the disappearance. Then we have this uh, you know, married guy, maybe. And then we have this guy, Dale, who um, Sue had talked about calling at her work, but he's never been identified. Uh, you know, and then we have to maybe be open to the idea that on this day, just it was some other person who saw her in that gas station and pulled up and, and picked her up. Okay, so we have a lot of uh, possibilities here. Please. We have four. Yeah, yes. four. Okay. Mm -hmm. I think the, the listeners uh, will get the uh, feeling, as you've expressed more than once in this interview, Christine, that this uh, last you know, 34 plus years, uh, have been absolute hell for you and your mother and all the people who knew Sue personally, uh, friends or other family members. You know, how do you um, continue, uh, you know, to get through each day? I know you're, you know, very emotionally affected by this. Um, how have you found it, you know, to make it here till 2022 from 1988? I'm not exactly sure. <laughs> I mean, I wake up, lately I've been waking up since I've turned 50. I think maybe you just reflect back more, but lately I have felt like I'm, it's like back to the future. I mean, it's, um, I was anorexic for years, and I, I wasn't doing much. Like I told you earlier is I'm in college at 50, which is fine mm -hmm. to be in college, but, you know, I, they're pretty, pretty much hiding from the world. I mean, I, I do, you know, I've got friends, and I've got my, you know, I go to the West Coast a lot, um, go north of Seattle, and I have a lot of friends up there, because I have cousins up there, but here, since we've moved from Lake Elmo, 
I don't have any friends in the cities. If that's um, a good explanation of how life has been, mm. I haven't been able to connect. Um, it's what I call life is just lost without mm. her because she's so much a part of me. I just, I think about it every day. I think about yeah. her every day. And it's just so much a part of me, her disappearance. It's just, it's hard. I, I did not get married um, in high school. It just, um, I just stopped pretty much living. And had I had online been around, I would have been in online school, if that. I just didn't want to go to school. I didn't, I, nothing mattered anymore. Mm-hmm. So... Then I went into the anorexia, then I, you know, I've been, oh my. I think, you know, I lost my 20s, my 30s. I didn't wake up until basically my 40. So um, mm-hmm. then I made it the best 10 years huh. that I've ever had. Great. Um, I'm glad to hear it. Yeah. I finally was thinking that I mattered mm-hmm. and that is a lot of people... You know, but I haven't been able to, a lot of the family members, what people don't know is I disconnected with my family as well because I just didn't, I didn't want to be, so I've lost a lot of time with my cousins. I mean, the last time I was around them a lot was when they were three to eight years old. Now they're in their 40s, 30s, 40s. So that's how much time you lose. Yeah. Um, and then on it's just so different because nobody knows what to say. It's it's not a death. It's not anything. It's just up in the air, no closure. So nobody knows what to say to us. So yeah. it's it very insular. Sure. Um, it's very, you can't, it's hard to connect. I was just going to ask you about connection. Uh, that's a very interesting. You finish your comments there with that point because I was going to ask you, being that you're the younger sister, and I know that uh, although we don't do theories on the program, I know that the listeners will get the idea that you you suspect this bumpers guy uh, in um, Sue's disappearance, and I'm wondering how that affect. Of course, this guy, you know, was a guy that she was interested in, had gone out with a couple times. Do you think that that affected? how you look at relationships all these years. Definitely. I didn't, tr- I, I had a hard tr- time trusting men. Mm-hmm. I mean, it yeah. wasn't until I was 40 that I started dating. Yeah. So wow. I just didn't want to be around men. It just felt like just that's not where I want to go. And that would have been a time to get married, to have children, to have a life, generations, all mm-hmm. of that, and it's just not there. Mm. So you just have to, you know, mm-hmm. maybe all of that will come 50 mm. on up, except for the children, <laughs> but, um, you know, uh-huh. I mean, I'm, I'm in college to be yeah, a teacher. Yeah, great, yeah. Elementary. I've always um, been around kids um, to see. I've been really, really lucky to um, be at an elementary school as a paraprofessional um, and be with kids that are really needing help. And I just think that's that seems mm. to me, be my go-to. That's where I seem to need to be is be with children that really need help because, mm. you know, I'm that seems to be my connection mm-hmm. with things. So, Well, you know, Christine, it may very well may be that in that maybe you and I uh, have something in common because, you know, I've been doing this program for five and a half years, and this is easily the greatest thing that I've ever done with my life. And I didn't start doing this until I was 46. You know, so, you know, there's always, you know, I know you talked about your 20s and 30s being kind of a lost time and then your 40s being a great time. I can certainly relate to that. Um, you know, it's, you know, it's, you know, I think you got a lot of time. You're going to school. I have high hopes for you. You never know when you're going to find that thing that just works for you in your life. And if it happens at 50, that's fine too. It is. 
because I'm going to be, let's see, I'll be 54 when I graduate, and I'd be 54 anyways, right? Mm-hmm. That's right. You would be. That's right. That's right. The only way to think. Mm-hmm. Now, you have mentioned uh, during the program, uh, this interview, uh, about the Facebook page that you have. Why don't you tell the listeners on uh, the name of it, uh, a little bit of what you do there, this Facebook page. Uh, right now, why don't you tell the listeners about it? Well, the Facebook page is called Swedell Strong. Uh, spelling is S-W-E-D-E-L-L and a strong. And um, it's, once you go in there, it's tons of photos of Sue and I. It's memory lane. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's trying to tell everybody anything and everything about Sue, Sue and I, family, um, friends, and of course, everything about what happened yeah. as much as I can get into detail and how I feel sometimes when I, I just when I'm feeling extra down or something like that it feels like a good outlet a good source for me to go to and get support so yeah. um, I got a thousand people following it wow. and yeah um, some of my posters have um, because there's been so many people reaching it um, and sharing, there has been, on one of her posters, got up to 30,000 reaches. Oh, my. So I was just in shock. But yeah. I, it's just amazing what you can do with a page. Um, Absolutely. It so small, and it was, is now, it's, mm -hmm. it is um, going around the world right now. So yeah. um, I'm really proud of it. Um, what I can, the least I can do for Sue. Yeah. So it's, yeah. Yeah, and you've mentioned uh, probably uh, one of the things I think that has come out of this interview that had something to do with this Facebook page was this witness, the the person who worked at the gas station. You know, know. that that's how it's you two re uh, reconnected. Yeah, it's 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 interesting. I mean, I only talked with her once, but mm. she's. Now a Facebook friend of mine, so she it's it's different yeah. because she's the last person to see Sue, and mm -hmm. I just want to just take that moment and just God, you know, it's like I want to I don't want to poke her too much about details yet I want it. Yeah. Um, yes. If I poke her, you know, she's gonna leave. And um, I I can't can't have that happen. No right. Yeah, you have to kid gloves. I agree, kid gloves. Exactly. Mhm. Mm okay. Uh, Christine, any final words before we complete this interview? Well, I hope that I have said enough um, to possibly. You know, especially, well, obviously get the word out about mm -hmm. Sue, but yeah. I'm hoping that some of these details I've given enough out. I know people are always wanting names, but um, hopefully what you have put out on um, online um, for pictures, yeah. maybe of the car, the sketch, maybe jostle somebody's brain you know hey i knew that person or so and so and that would be you know um i you know that is the description of him at that time it's like a day later so a lot of people want you know an updated sketch as to what he would be now no it would you would remember that person if we go to reunions and school reunions, and we say, hey, you know, this is how I remembered you by. So you do have a good memory in that. We go to reunions because we remember them at a certain, you know, a certain way. So if you can try to, you know, think about what that person may have looked like, who you may have looked like, so, you know, who that person may have, you know, a friend, neighbor, any of that, so somebody mm -hmm. knows something. I know it's repetitive in saying that, but literally somebody knows some something. So I think, I yeah, I, I think that 
what is probably going to stick out to people is that obviously somebody tampered with the car. My opinion, once again, having covered 240 disappearances, my guess is whether it was this guy from Bumpers or somebody else, and I, you know, of course, I continue to always be open minded because you never know when the facts are going to change. But what it tells me is this is probably something that this person, probably a guy, this guy did before. He was, uh, you know, wanted to meet a, a girl or a woman and couldn't figure out a way to do that. So, you know, tamper with a car, do this, just happen to run into her somewhere. So I think what we would be looking for are women in the area where Sue disappeared who said, you know what, back in 1988, I went out with this guy and, you know, I just happened to run into him somewhere. And, and all these years later, I'm thinking, man, that seemed weird. Man, that was a coincidence. Man, how was it? He just happened to be at the right place at the right time. I think it would be that type of thing that we're looking for now. Cause... And, possibly, and possibly somebody that I'm trying to think of how that person could be so close by. Yeah, that's right. Is it in Washington County? Right. Stillwater. I'm, I'm, as I get older, I'm narrowing it down. I'm mm. narrowing the because of the blizzard yeah yeah christine anything else i just want to um end with that um hopefully that you have really followed along as to who sue was yeah the human humanizing sue as to this person that you know she's my sister think about your siblings think about how much they mean to you um think about how this could affect you and how it has affected me and this is, this is my only sister um yeah it's uh, it's it's like a pit on of mm. goes to the pit of your stomach it's your soul's Mm -hmm. feels like it's ruined um, until yeah. you is really in this lifetime you know if we have other lifetimes whatever but this <laughs> lifetime is broken so well Christine uh, all I can tell you is uh, I'll do my best to try to help you fix it uh, that's why I'm here uh, of course in most of these disappearances there are no easy answers but uh, I, I want you to know, as I tell all the guests, that I'll always be someone you can trust. I will always give you uh, my best advice, my best insight, even if it is a disappearance that's 34 years old. And maybe it seems like it's gone a little, the trail has gone a little cold right now. Um, I want you to always view me. Besides interviewing for this program, I want you to view me as a resource, somebody to talk to, you know, something popped up. You know, you let me know. We'll have a confidential conversation about it. So you and your mother and anybody else, everybody else who cares about Sue, you know, you won't feel like you're in the dark out there, that there's somebody out here who, who's always going to be thinking about Sue and how to move this case in this investigation forward. I'd like you to think Thank of me so that way. Thank you. Thank you. That you're, means a lot. You're, you're very welcome. This is what I do. This is the only thing I do. So um, I... I I don't have anything else to do. I do this. It's very important to me. It's a passion in my life. And so uh, I'm here to help and try to move any of these investigations along. So, thank you. Thank anyway. you. You're very welcome. And I thank you for being on this episode of Unfound. And that was my February 19th, 2022 interview with Christine Swaddell, sister of Sue Swaddell. I thank her for joining me and all of you on this episode. After the interview, Christine told me to stress to all of you that Sue would have never run away. Never. In addition, Christine told me that at one time, the gas station attendant said the car the person of interest was driving was black, not white. Why the change? I'm not sure. For my own knowledge, I looked up two very important items and passed them along to Christine. I will now tell you about them. First, 
Christine was correct in saying the bumpers guy has had a lot of problems since 1988. Lots of charges involving the words fraud, swindle, theft, and forgery. But no charges having anything to do with violence that I could find. However, those kinds of crimes do usually involve a kind of creativity that could translate to disabling a car. Second, and on that topic, I looked up 1975 Oldsmobile cutlasses, specifically the interiors. Why? Well, many of you may not know that there was a time when cars' hoods could be opened from the outside. There was no latch release inside the car. Yes, somebody could just come up and open the hood without having to enter the car. Yet, by 1975, all cutlasses had a hood release on the inside. So we might have to believe that whoever tampered with Sue's car had access to the interior of her car, so as to open the hood and fiddle with the radiator. But where the fitting would be to drain the radiator is in a spot where someone could simply just lie down on the pavement and reach the spot without needing to open the hood at all. I'm not sure the police realized this or not. They could have canvassed the parking lot of the Kmart to see if anyone noticed a guy on the ground under Sue's car, and did that description of him match the one of the guy who picked her up. What I'm saying is somebody didn't necessarily need access to the interior of Sue's car, to drain the radiator. I don't know about all of you, but I get a feeling that somebody really wanted to see Sue that day. The person tracked her to her work on a day in which there were blizzard conditions. This person got down on the ground of a parking lot and loosened the radiator fitting, taking the risk of getting caught, then waited around for her to leave. And this person did all of this with no guarantee that all of this would work. Sue could have not realized the car's problem and made it the whole way home frying the engine. The person could have been following her and lost her in traffic. Sue could have pulled into a location where picking her up would not have been possible. On and on and on. But somehow, this person's plan worked. Remember, though, there is no proof this person wanted her to disappear. But this is what happened. As for her clothes ending up back in her house, seriously, one of the strangest facts I've ever heard. It would make total sense to think that this was some kind of taunting by the perpetrator. But the items were under Sue's bed as if hidden, although the dirty dishes could be seen as provocative. I'm sure many of you will find a variety of reasons that the suspect did this. The question is, how do we get this disappearance out of the cold case trap and get this young woman some justice? I'll leave the theorizing up to you. And that's the program. If you found it informative, please go to the app that you use to listen to Unfound and give this podcast a nice review. I thank you for listening. I'm Ed Denzel, and you've been listening to Unfound.